All right, everyone. Welcome back. <clears throat> so uh, I'm pretty excited for this lecture. Uh, last week, we kind of took a technical break, or took a break from the technical side. Um, this week, we're going all in. Um, <laughs> so a lot is going to be flying at you throughout this. Uh, hang tight. Um, but I hope this will give you like a, an idea of all the different pieces required to make Bitcoin work together, um, all the different fundamentals, and you'll get to learn a lot about the kind of low-level implementation of details of Bitcoin. So without any further ado, Philip's going to start the cryptography side of this lecture, and I'll complete with the like data structures and Bitcoin side. All right, sweet. So yeah, uh, we're going to be starting with the cryptography and what we really want to nail down right now is uh, cryptography and some of the things we'll be going over are so key in so many different protocols. Um, it's really critical to understand these so you can build high level systems on top of them. Um, and so I know I've gone over it before, but we need to really go over hashing again and make it a little bit more rigorous. Uh, so we can define a cryptographic hash function uh, as a mapping from an arbitrary bit stream to any fixed size bit string. And so you'll notice this notation is basically like uh, any bit, like the star, which is like arbitrary bit string, basically. Um, and you'll uh, note that a, a hash function, at least a cryptographic hash function, has to be deterministic. Uh, so the same input always yields the same output. Um, so if I pass it in five and I get some blob, I should always get that same blob whenever I pass five in. Um, and so as Bruce Schneier likes to, uh, likes to say, is uh, cryptographic hash functions are the workhorses of modern cryptography. We use them everywhere. It's in pretty much every protocol. And so there are a few key properties uh, of cryptographic hash functions that we have to keep in mind. Uh, the first is pre-image resistance. Uh, actually, before I go into that, I'll make a note on notation. So I denote like private like hidden variables as uh, colored with red, and blue public variables as colored with blue. Uh, it's important to keep in mind what information is hidden and what is not when you're doing kind of like cryptographic adversarial uh, protocol specifications, I guess. Um, anyway, so with freedom resistance, uh, what that means is you have this private input x, which is an arbitrary bit string or a message or something, uh, and you have this hash output y. This is y equals h of x, uh, knowing that the hash is being applied on the message. Um, and what is key is that if an adversary has this y value, it should be computationally difficult to find x, uh, such that they can like find x, put it through the hash value, and get y again. So finding the pre-image, or the like pre this is the pre-image, of the hash value, or the hash function, should be very difficult. Uh, and you'll see why it's key in a second. Uh, and when I say computationally difficult, I mean it should take you know, some adversary a lot of time to uh, guess at whatever x is. So the second property is second pre-image resistance. Uh, this is basically uh, given some hash output, so the uh, adversary only knows the hash output, uh, they need to find some hash input that maps to the same hash output. This should also be very difficult. And again, we'll see why this is useful in certain protocols. Uh, and finally, we have collision resistance. Uh, collision resistance is basically finding any two messages, or any two inputs that map to the same output. Uh, equivalently, you have the probability that any of these two uh, messages map to the same output, or finding two messages that map to the same output should be computationally difficult. Um, and so there's a really interesting uh, theorem called the uh, birthday attack, or up bound, or whatever, uh, that states that it's um, finding a hash collision in any hash function is bounded above by the square root of the hash base. Uh, so if you have SHA-256, which has a 256-bit uh, you know, output, um, you're going to have a you know, order of 2 to the 128 
order of like computational steps to find a collision. And this is called a birthday attack. And it's, yeah? Uh, by a collision, you mean like find, given a particular x, finding the thing that aligns with it, or finding any two things? Any that two that collisions. Okay. Any two inputs that map to the same output. The finding a value that maps to a particular output is the second preimage uh, resistance property. Yeah, they're, they're very similar, but uh, this one's easier to find. Um, and there are certain uh, cryptographic hash functions that were thought to be collision resistant, but are actually not anymore. Uh, for example, I think MB4 uh, is not collision resistant anymore. And I think SHA1 or something, yeah, there's a few that were like very widely used and are, not, are no, now not used because they were shown to be not collision resistant. Meaning there's an algorithm that create collisions really easily, or they found like one collision? Um, yes, <laughs> to both of them. Okay. Uh, so I think with MD4, there's a particular issue in like the block construction um, where there's like leaked entropy, you know. Basically it means that if you uh, observe one hash output, you can pretty easily find like uh, other similar things that hash the same thing. But yeah. That's kind of out of scope, I guess. Uh, so why are these cryptographic hash functions useful? Um, since we're in a cryptography, or sorry, <laughs> cryptocurrency class, you know, we've got Merkle trees, we've got proof of work. Uh, crypt uh, cryptographic hash functions make really good like puzzle uh, mechanics or proof of work. Uh, there's also uh, transaction box addresses are all referenced by hash value. Um, so if you think of like a pointer pointing to some memory address, this is like a pointer pointing to something with a value that hashes uh, to the hash value, basically. Uh, there's also other uh, uses and other protocols. Uh, for example, message authentication codes, HMACs, are for basically verifying that a message wasn't modified in transit. Uh, there are password verification. So for example, on your computer, uh, or when you log into like a website, uh, usually you don't send uh, your password in plain text. You send your password uh, as like a hash with a salt or something, and the server compares uh, two hash values. Um, that way, if someone or if the server which is storing all these password hashes gets uh, compromised, the attacker only has a list of password hashes, and not the actual password values. And finding the pre-images the, you know, uh, your actual password and the salt that maps to that uh, password hash value is more difficult. Um, and that's why you always hear like salt your salt and hash your passwords if you're making a database with passwords in it. Uh, also commitment schemes, which we'll go over in a second, and pseudo random number generators can also be built using cryptographic hash functions as a primitive. Um, so to better illustrate some of these <clears throat> Sorry, uh, cryptographic hash function properties. I figured I'd go over like a quick example, uh, which I call the simple hash commitment scheme. Um, so, for example, say you got two people, Alice and Bob, and they're betting on the outcome of a coin flip. So Alice guesses that the coin flip is going to be heads, and Bob flips the coin and it's heads. Alice gets a hundred dollars. Otherwise, Bob gets hundred dollars. Uh, so we have a simple like adversarial game. Uh, you, can find, you can list it out in like a protocol where you know Alice first calls the outcome of the coin flip, Bob then flips the coin, and then you know if the coin is the same value as her guess, then Alice wins. Otherwise, she loses. Um, but now we can consider a case where this game is being played remotely. So Alice and Bob are not in the same location, um, and furthermore, Alice and Bob don't trust each other. So if naively uh, Alice called the outcome of the coin flip, sent her guess to Bob. Uh, so now Bob knows Alice's guess, but he hasn't flipped the coin yet. He can just tell Alice that, oh, you know, you guessed heads, but uh, you know, I definitely guessed tails, and send her tails. And she's like, oh darn, I lost. So how can we prevent that? We can use uh, what's called a commitment. Uh, Alice can commit to her guess without actually telling Bob what her guess was. And so Bob has to flip his coin regardless and send her the result. And by the property of the commitment, 
uh, you should be able to unpack the commitment and get the original guess out. And so then both people can easily verify that uh, the guess and the outcome you know, lead, yield a certain result. Uh, so a simple way to do commitments is with a hash function, or a cryptographic hash function. Um, and the actual protocol is, first Alice chooses a large random number, um, otherwise called a nonce, or number used once. Uh, Alice then guesses the outcome of the coin flip, uh, and she generates a commitment. And so the commitment is C, which is the hash of uh, the coin flip concatenated with the large random number, uh, where these double bars is concatenation. Um, and so Alice sends her commitment to Bob. Bob flips the coin and sends the value to Alice. And now Alice has to reveal her commitment. Uh, so what she does is she sends her guess, B, and her, uh, random, her random number, R, uh, to Bob. And so Bob can now check that the commitment is... Uh, valid by basically doing on his own side hashing the uh, concatenation uh, of the guess and the random number that Alice just sent him and comparing it with the original commitment. And if these two are the same value, then he knows that Alice didn't change her guess. And in that way, both Alice and Bob know the outcome of Bob's coin flip and Alice's guess value. And so they can easily uh, agree on who won or lost the that. And so, you know, if you look at this for a second, how can you convince yourself that no one can cheat in this protocol? The key part is in the hashing of this, like, value. Um, specifically, if we look at how Bob could cheat Alice, um, when Bob first receives Alice's <coughs> commitment, if he can somehow unpack Alice's guess and then send her the opposite flip value, he will win, guaranteed. So, but the only way he can unpack the commitment is by somehow guessing the pre-image to the hash commitment. And so, you know, if your hash function is pre-image resistant, this shouldn't be computationally feasible. Likewise, if Alice wants to cheat Bob, um, you know, she sends her original commitment and Bob sends her the coin flip value. For Alice to guarantee a win, you know, either she got the guess right, but if she didn't get it right, she wants to be able to change her guess, like mid protocol, and send Bob a, uh, you know, not B, instead of uh, the original guess. And so, if she can somehow generate a new commitment that has the same commitment hash value as the original commitment, uh, but well, having the different um, guess value and a, probably a different random number, then she wins, guaranteed. And so the only way she can do this is with uh, a cryptographic hash function that's not second pre-image resistant. So these are kind of illustrating why these cryptographic hash function properties are useful in certain protocols like this simple hash commitment scheme. Question? Or, no. All right, so kind of changing gears a little bit. We're going to talk about briefly. Uh, briefly talk about elliptic curves, and so uh, for the most part, you don't really need to know what exactly an elliptic curve is or how it's used, uh, other than it makes for a really good primitive for uh, or really it makes a really good finite field that you can pose a discrete logarithm problem on, which we'll then use in digital signatures in uh, a few minutes. But anyway, I digress. Uh, we can define an elliptic curve by uh, this equation in the uh, affine long by Vs cross form. Uh, but we usually consider the shorter one. Uh, you can show there's a mapping. Um, but what's interesting is if you plot this on the real number plane, you get this cool, like, squiggly thing. <laughs> uh, and it's, uh, uh, what is it? Ref uh, reflected across the x axis. Um, which will come in handy in a second. Uh, but we can define uh, a group law on this elliptic curve uh, group. Uh, we're essentially given any two points on the elliptic curve. Uh, we do what's called a chord tangent process. And we call this like point multiplication. Uh, 
in kind of you know graphical form, what you do is you take P and Q, you draw a line between them. And because of the property of this particular elliptic curve, uh, you get this point R, which intersects with the curve at some point between P and Q. And what you do is you take R and you flip it around, and this is P times Q, basically. Um, and this is just something we define. Uh, you know, with you know abstract algebra, you can define like any kind of random operation. But this is particularly use useful because you can show that it's on a finite uh, field. You can show that it's uh, cyclic or nearly cyclic, and this makes for a good um, kind of discrete logarithm type thing. Uh, so if we go a little more rigorously, uh, you can show between P and Q you have some slope s. And uh, a little bit of calculus, I'll just hand wave. Uh, you get those two <laughs> outputs. <laughs> um, and we can show again that this forms a, uh, over certain curves in certain finite fields, this forms a cyclic, or nearly cyclic, uh, finite abelian group. Where abelian means like it's commutative, basically. And so um, you can also show point squaring, basically where you have p times p. And in this case, you just take the tangent of p on the elliptic curve, you find the intersection, you flip it, and you get that set of <laughs> equations, basically. And so what's interesting is we can define uh, kind of like exponentiation for some positive n integer m. So you, know, you have some point p. p to the m is just p times p times p n times. Um, and so it is believed, uh, or at least currently thought, that there don't exist any sub-exponential time algorithms for finding the discrete logarithm of PVM in this uh, elliptic curve group. In other words, finding uh, this you know, expo exponent, of, uh, exponent value just given the uh, uh, exponentiation result uh, should not be computationally feasible. Um, and again, this holds over certain finite fields and cer certain curves. Um, and again, when I say uh, certain curves and certain finite fields, usually it's like a, uh, there, are, there are certain elliptic curves called super singular curves, which don't work, um, or curves with like particular characteristics, which don't work. Um, you can show they have like polynomial time algorithms or something. Uh, we don't really know that because we don't use those. Um, but regardless, uh, the reason why we use these elliptic curves uh, in, de in defining this uh, discrete logarithm problem is because they have much shorter proof sizes than they do in, say, like a finite field using like RSA or something. So, for example, um, if you're using uh, elliptic curve like <coughs> encryption, basically, uh, you can show that a elliptic curve. Um, has about a 256-bit phi size elliptic curve has about equivalent uh, security as like a 128-bit block cipher. Uh, since the fastest known uh, elliptic curve discrete logarithm algorithm is uh, parallel Poll Pollard's row, which runs in uh, order square root time, um, and this compares to like RSA or something, which uh, you need about uh, 2048 bit keys for equivalent uh, security. So you can see you get really good uh, efficiency savings or space efficiency savings with using like elliptic curves, which is probably the primary reason why uh, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies use it. And so now, with this in mind, we can uh, define a digital signature scheme uh, using elliptic curves. But first, let's define like digital signature, scheme, digital signature schemes in the abstract. Uh, so a digital signature is kind of similar to a regular signature. Uh, you've got certain things that you want. For example, with a regular signature, you know, you sign like a bank document or something, and you don't want someone else to be able to like forge a bank document, put your signature on it, and you know, send it to the bank, and then you lose all your money. That's not good. You want you don't don't want people to be able to forge a signature. Um, also, you don't want to you know sign your bank document. Um, send it by mail, and then halfway through, someone changes some numbers and then like sends all your money to them. You know, you don't want that either. 
Uh, so to put that a little more rigorously, uh, a digital signature scheme should be should have message integrity. So when you sign a message, uh, you don't want someone to be able to change the message and have the same signature still validate on that message. That shouldn't work. Also, you want a message origin to hold. So, for example, if you uh, you know if you if someone receives a message from you with your signature. Uh, you want to be able to verify that they, in fact, sent that message. In other words, if you receive a message in a signature pair, uh, you don't want it to be able to come from someone else. You don't want someone else to be able to forge a message signature. Uh, and also, you want non-repudiation. So you don't want someone to be able to, be able to revoke uh, or you know, backtrack and say that something that they signed wasn't actually signed by them. Uh, and so we can... Again, define a digital signature scheme using uh, two algorithms. Uh, the first is sign. So basically, you take a message or document M and a secret key, which is supposed to be held secret. Uh, and this returns a signature, uh, which should hold the properties that we enumerated previously. Uh, there should also be a verification algorithm. So Given a uh, signature, a message, and a public key, uh, you should be able to, you know, verify that you know if you get the right signature and the right public key, it should always return valid. Otherwise, it should always return invalid for any other possible signatures. And so. Uh, using elliptic curves, we can define a digital signature scheme uh, using the discrete logarithm property as our security uh, basis, more or less. And so one in particular is the elliptic curve digital signature algorithm. This compares with just the plain old digital signature algorithm, which operates only on like finite fields. Um, and so to define one of these, we need E, an elliptic curve, we need a generator point of the elliptic curve. I don't really need to know what this is, but just know that uh, the generator to the uh, order, or these, this big prime power, uh, or not prime power, this just big prime, uh, should be the origin point of the elliptic curve, which is like, uh, uh, go back. The origin point is just like this point here. It's the, it has some special properties, but we don't need that for now. And finally, we need a cryptographic hash uh, function. So <laughs> using these like four things, we can make a, a signature scheme which holds all of our uh, uh, properties. Uh, so first, in the setup phase, uh, the signer needs to create a secret key, which they basically choose randomly from zero to the big prime, uh, and then they generate their public key from their secret key. So essentially they take the generator point in the elliptic curve to the secret key. And so uh, one of the key reasons why I want the discrete logarithm to be hard is because we don't want someone to be able to recover the secret key from their public key. Because remember, the public key is you know spread everywhere. You want it to be able to like access from every recipient. Um, but if someone could generate your secret key from your public key, they could use it to forge any message from you. So if you recall, finding you know the exponent from just the you know output should be very hard. Um, and so if we look at the signature process, first what we do is we hash the message, uh, then we truncate the hash output to make it fall in the you know, uh, finite field range, basically. Um, and then we choose a secret, uh, just random number, basically. Uh, it's, called, it's kind of like an ephemeral key, if you're familiar with that. Uh, and what we do is we generate R and S. And R and S is our like, signature. So what R is is the uh, generator to the K uh, take out the x, take only the x coordinate modulo the prime power, or I keep saying power, just the prime. Um, and then s is this 
Yeah. We'll see why they're useful. <laughs> um, so in verify, we kind of, uh, we take R and S, which is the signature. Uh, we take the message, we take the public key. So using these four things, or I guess three kind of, because this is like one thing, new one. Uh, you take the signature, the message, and the public key. You're able to verify any message from any public or from someone's public key using their signature. Uh, so again, we take the hash value of uh, the message and put it into the like finite field space. Um, what we do is we you know, these two values and you know do a bunch of exponentiation and multiplication. Uh, it's not really important, but you know. Uh, what is important is that this B value uh, should equal R modulo P, where R is part of the signature. Uh, and we can show a quick proof sketch. Uh, I don't really want to go through this in too much detail. We don't have much time. Uh, but basically what you do is you do a bunch of math. <laughs> you can show that this value equals G to the K. Uh, so if you look back, oh, shit. Uh, look back one slide. You can show that this value v equals x chord of this thing equals g to the k if you pass in a valid signature. And so, if we look back at r, r equals x chord of g to the k mod p. So, if you if you do like the whole protocol correctly, uh, you can show that v will equal r, in which case your signature will, will validate. Uh, so that's just a quick like proof sketch. Uh, there's definitely more rigorous things you can prove about this. Uh, but anyway, uh, the reason why we use elliptic curve digital signatures is because recall that elliptic curves give us really small proof sizes, so it's very space efficient. And we also, uh, in the context of like Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, uh, we need signatures to be able to prove that we own some, you know, transaction output, basically. Uh, so, you know, when you say you own, like, five Bitcoin, what you're really saying is I have the private keys to uh, five Bitcoin worth of, like, transaction outputs. Uh, and that's where these digital signatures come in with, like, cryptocurrencies. And so with that in mind, we're, we'll transfer over to kind of the uh, more in-depth look at the actual block structure. All right. <clears throat> so in this section, I'm going to be talking more about the technical quirks and implementation details of Bitcoin. It's a lot of material very specific to Bitcoin, but you'll get a feel as to the de design philosophy of Bitcoin. Um, in general, Bitcoin is optimized to be very simple and efficient, but also robust and extensible. Um, leaving as little room for error as possible. Uh, another thing to kind of think about as we go through all this is that Satoshi Nakamoto designed all this. Um, just keep that in mind. All right. So first thing, we're going to be going through transactions again. We start with this notion of account-based versus transaction-based ledgers again. So in an account-based ledger, whenever you receive a transaction from Alice, you need to in order to verify that she has the required amount of funds, you need to scan through every transaction that she's ever had in and out. Um, that requires a lot of additional maintenance, and it's error prone, uh, requires a lot of housekeeping. So that's why Bitcoin uses a transaction-based ledger. Um, it's also called triple entry accounting, where, like we keep on reiterating, you're spending from previous unspent outputs. Um, some of the particular features of transaction-based ledgers include uh, ha having to use change addresses because each output can only be spent once. Um, efficient verification uh, kind of fixes that problem of not having to scan through the entire history. You only need to read the recent history to see if this transaction has been spent yet. And you can also do things like joint payments where you have two inputs and one output. And for each of those inputs, they can belong to different people. Um, all you need is uh, Alice and Bob can jointly like sign their part of the transaction and broadcast it together. And that ensures that, like, okay, this money is only going to go through to this new address if both of us sign. So it's, for example, it's, it would be a good way to uh, transfer money to a multi-signature address. So let's take an even closer look at what transactions are. 
Uh, this right here is very close to the actual representation of a Bitcoin transaction. The only difference is that this isn't compressed and byte encoded, so it's human readable still. Uh, you'll notice we have some metadata, which includes like the version, the number of inputs and outputs for easy parsing, and we also have the lock time, which is uh, an advanced concept that we'll talk about later. It's useful for Bitcoin scripting and is how we can make Bitcoin scalable. Um, you'll notice in the inputs that the uh, it references a previous output right here, and it references a hash. So this is the hash of the previous transaction. Whenever we refer to previous transactions or previous blocks, we typically use a hash pointer. So that's why we use the hash as the ID. Um, and we also have an index of the output uh, of the previous transaction. Um, and in order to spend this output, you need a signature to verify that, oh, you actually uh, have control of this public key. <clears throat> and then now in our outputs, uh, there's a value, uh, pretty clear. And we also have something called a script pub key. So the thing in Bitcoin is that uh, each output doesn't simply specify a public key. Uh, it actually specifies a script. So why do we use Bitcoin scripts instead of simply assigning public keys or addresses? Uh, the short answer is that it allows more, more functionality and extensibility of Bitcoin. So looking at the semantics of an output, like, like we said, you're spending from previous outputs and you're, the address uh, that you sent to is also the hash of that person's public key. So whenever you're saying like, oh, this amount can be redeemed by the owner of this address X, you don't actually know the public key because you don't know the pre-image of that hash function. So instead, what you have to say, you, you need to write a script that says, this amount can be redeemed by the public key that hashes to this address plus a signature from the owner of that public key. Um, so let's walk through an example. Um, you'll notice here that we have two transactions. These represent uh, like the inputs, outputs of the previous transaction, and the inputs and outputs of the redeeming transaction. And you'll notice that this input is a script too. So you can think of this input kind of as like a parameter that you're passing into this function that, that's being defined here. Um, how do you make the input and output script work together? Well, you simply concatenate them. And if that sounds hacky to you, then that's right. Apparently, that's how we like to do things in Bitcoin. Uh, so, more formally, the input script is called a script sig because it contains a signature, and the output script is called the script pub key because it specifies a pub key. Um, yeah, okay, so let's take a closer look at how this script actually executes. So, just remember that we had the input of the new transaction concatenate without the output, and you can just execute the code uh, line by line. So Bitcoin uses a language built specifically for Bitcoin called script, or most people just call it this Bitcoin scripting language. Um, a few features. Uh, it's stack-based and it has built-in instructions for cryptography, like uh, hashing and verifying signatures. You uh, implement these instructions just in uh, one line. Or, I mean, or you call these instructions as like one line. Um, it, and it's also very simple. So notably, it's not Turing complete, meaning that uh, it's very restricted in the logic and expressibility of like applications that we can build with this. Um, one of the benefits of that is that there's no loops. So if we're infinite, an attacker were to write an infinite loop into a Bitcoin script, uh, like since we haven't solved the halting problem, um, we wouldn't know that that's an infinite loop. So that uh, that's like one optimization that we can avoid here. Um, all right, so walking through this example transaction, uh, first, these first two instructions are sig and pub key. So these are simply data instructions. You'll note because they have like the bracket. And data instructions are very simple. You just add it onto the stack. So you uh, push sig onto the stack and you push pub key onto the stack. Op dupe uh, duplicates the top value on the stack. So we have an extra pub key here. And op hash, hash is the top value on this stack. So we result with sig pub key and pub key hash. Now we've gotten to this fifth step of 
the script, which is right here, the pub key, uh, the public key that was specified by the output transaction. Um, so uh, note that we have a question mark here, and this is uh, a data instruction, so we're adding this um, pub key that's specified by the sender of the transaction um, onto this stack. Now, uh, notice that this first pub key, the one without the question mark, uh, actually came from the input script because this pub key was specified here and it was hashed here. So now you have two pub key hashes and uh, like what do you do? You need to verify that they're equal, right? So that's, just, that's why we use op equal verify which just throws an error if the top two values on the stack are not equal, otherwise the script resumes execution. And for the last thing, we have our uh, cryptographic opcode, which is just op check signature. Um, it looks at the top two values of the stack, uh, the public key and the signature, and checks if they match. Uh, and in one instruction, it validates that it's true. And therefore, um, miners validating this tra transaction will say, OK, this is a valid transaction. <clears throat> All right, there's also something called uh, proof of burn. So uh, last time for our homework, we mentioned like, oh, it'd be really cool like, if you can uh, sign your name onto the blockchain or some message. Um, but it turned out to be a little harder than we expected, so we decided, against it, decided not to do that. Um, but there's a site called cryptographiti.info where you can look at what a number of people have engraved onto the blockchain. And this is data that's gonna be there forever. Uh, it's pretty cool. Check it out. Like, uh, this is like I was here. I existed. I lived, love, had good and bad times. Pretty poetic for something on a 83 gigabyte blockchain. <laughs> uh, so, how do you write this arbitrary data into the blockchain? Um, there's an opcode called opreturn, which throws an error if you call it. Uh, basically, it means that this output script can't be spent because it's always going to throw an error. So what happens is you're, then you can use the following uh, uh, like data amount to write whatever you want. You can write your dank memes, um, <laughs> anything you want into the blockchain. Uh, and some of the use cases of this is you can prove that something existed at this particular point in time. So for example, if you, uh, if you like coin a word and you want to be like, hey, like, here's my public key. I'm going to spend a little bit of money from this public key to prove that I came up with this word, and here it is in the blockchain. Um, that's something you can do. Or like, this is something good for creative works, where you come up with uh, music, and or or like I don't know, a poem or something. Uh, and someone else contests that who actually wrote the poem. Well, you can say, look, this uh, I've engraved the hash of this poem onto the blockchain, um, and it came from my public key. So I just proved that it was originally mine. Um, another thing you can do is you can bootstrap another cryptocurrency, uh, kind of make the value of that cryptocurrency uh, derive from an equivalent decrease in the value in Bitcoin. So it, you can use the op return to force someone to destroy a small amount of Bitcoin in order to gain currency in uh, the new cryptocurrency. Uh, that's I think that's called uh, pegging or pegs like uh, one-way peg. Um, which we'll be talking about later as well in later lectures. Okay, so let's go back to scripting to clarify an important detail. In Bitcoin, spenders, or senders write a script such that the recipient is able to redeem that transaction. So the example that we walked through two slides ago uh, was an example of something called uh, pay to public key hash. Um, and this is the simplest case and the most uh, common case, which is, oh, just send your coins to the hash of this public key. But for complicated scripts, the sender of the coins would still need to specify that script exactly, which can be a problem. For example, what if you went to a store and all you want to do is uh, make your transaction, uh, you've made your purchase and you just want to leave, but your vendor says, wait, we, we use multi-signature now. You'll need to write a complicated output script that will allow us to spend using multiple signatures. By the way, you can't make any errors, otherwise your money will be lost forever. Uh, so you can kind of see why this is a problem. Like how would the sender know how to specify this output script? So Bitcoin gets around this with a clever trick called pay to script hash. Um, so pay to public key is send your coins to the hash of this public key. But pay to script hash is 
send your coins to the hash of this script. To redeem those coins, you must reveal the script that has this given hash and provide data that will make the script evaluate to true. Um, so this, essentially we've offloaded the complicated script writing to the recipient of the funds. It makes more sense from a payer payee standpoint because if a company wants to receive money and use something complicated like multi-signature, they shouldn't have to burden their customers by forcing them to write something really complicated. Instead, they write the script themselves and give the hash to the customer. Furthermore, the customer doesn't really care what the script itself is. All they care about is getting their goods. So um, as long as they get goods after sending a uh, script to this, or sending make a transaction to this script hash, uh, then it's up to the company to write the script correctly and ensure that they actually receive their money. Um, and it also makes sense in that the, cu the customer shouldn't no need to know anything about how the company holds their funds in order to be able to send money to them. Uh, so yeah, basically pay to script hash is a really clever trick that has turned out to be the biggest enhancement to Bitcoin ever since it's come out. Okay, so now we'll be covering Merkle trees and the Bitcoin data structure a little bit formally. Okay, I'm gonna speed up a little bit because we're running out of time. In its most <clears throat> general form, a Merkle tree hashes a number of blobs of data together and hashes those hashes together, resulting in a Merkle root. And one of the unique properties of this is that, say you wanted to prove that this blob of data, this third one, is included in the tree corresponding to this Merkle root. All you have to do is save the, these uh, branch, or, or I mean, yeah, save these branch hash values um, and give them to someone when you want to verify it. And they can hash it themselves and say, oh, wow, okay, it resulted in the correct Merkle root. Was the code word misspelled or was, was, or is it misspelled on purpose? Oh, oh where? The code, the code word for the Oh, <laughs> yeah, it was misspelled, okay. not on purpose, yeah. Uh, okay, so this is probably obvious to you already, but in Bitcoin, the leaves of the Merkle tree are just the transactions. Uh, one other little implementation detail of Bitcoin is that if we don't fill up the whole bottom of the Merkle tree, we simply, we simply duplicate the last transaction a number of times until we have a full tree. Um, is there rebalancing of the Merkle tree? Uh, no, it's, you, yeah, you just specify any order and then, yeah. Uh, okay, so there's also two hash uh, data structures in Bitcoin. So notably, we have this uh, block header hash, and you'll note that if we uh, tamper with any of the values here, that would affect the hash of this block, which would make this pointer invalid. So that's how you can tell that something was tampered with. Uh, likewise, like, likewise with this Merkle tree. So having this Merkle root inside the block header makes everything in Bitcoin uh, tamper evident. All right, so mining in more detail. Previously, we said that uh, when you're mining, you're hashing the Merkle root, uh, the previous block hash, and a nonce to try to get some uh, hash output that is below some target value. But there's actually two nonces. There's one in the block header, and there's one in the Coinbase transaction. Why do we have two nonces? Uh, and, and in what order do you vary these nonces when you're actually mining? Well, the key is that the nonce in the block header is actually 32 bits. So taking a look at the state of the art uh, ASICs today, we have Antminer that hashes 14 terahash per second. So that's 14 trillion hashes per second. Um, how long does it take Antminer S9 to try all of the combinations contained in this 32-bit nonce? Well, it takes 0 0.003 seconds. In other words, it can exhaust that combination 3,000 times a second. So what you do is uh, typically you're looking for uh, the nonce. Uh, you're, you're iterating through this nonce. You're probably not going to find a good output. So then you iterate through, increment this Coinbase nonce, which will propagate up the tree and change this Merkle root. And then you can iterate through this uh, block header nonce again. We want to do it in this order because uh, Iterating the Coinbase nonce is a lot less efficient since it has to propagate up the tree and takes log n time. All right, so uh, we also have something called simplified payment verification. So 
the current size of the Bitcoin blockchain is 83.3 gigabytes. Uh, when I first started school here at Berkeley in 2014, uh, it was still 23 gigabytes. Um, and so in two years, it tripled in size. Like this is a big problem if we want to keep Bitcoin feasible for users. Um, so this is why we have something called simplified payment verification. Uh, you'll, you'll have something called SPP, or SPV nodes or FIN clients as opposed to full nodes that store the whole blockchain. Um, the SPV nodes only store the parts of the blockchain that are relevant to them and for, uh, to verify the transactions that, are, that they are interested in. Nearly all nodes on the network are SPV nodes. I think it's like 99 out of 100 or something. So if you're using uh, wallet software where you actually hold your own private keys, uh, chances are it's an SPV node unless you somehow have 83 gigabytes on your phone. <clears throat> okay, so going into more detail in, into SPV, it only keeps the block headers of the blockchain. It keeps a full list of block headers. And you obtain this by querying different full nodes in the network um, until you ba you're basically convinced that this is right. Because remember, uh, the block headers contain the proof of work and have a hash pointer to the previous one. So it's really hard to actually create these block headers. Um, so when you, how do you validate an incoming transaction? So say you're a merchant selling Harambe posters online and running an SPV node. A uh, customer sends you an incoming transaction. Then tra transaction output specifies your Bitcoin address, so you know that this is a fresh, unspent Bitcoin output, unless uh, you're weird and want to double spend on yourself. So now all you need to verify is that this transaction was included in a block. Um, and uh, that's how you can conclude that this transaction, uh, or that this person isn't trying to double spend on you. So you go over to a bunch of your full node friends and ask them to give you the intermediate hashes for uh, this transaction, the Merkle branch, like all the intermediate hashes in this Merkle tree. And you can hash this incoming transaction with the data provided to you from the full node. And if that, if that resulting value matches the Merkle root that you had stored in your local uh, list of block headers, then you know that this transaction was included in a block. Now the only thing left is, okay, this transaction was included in a block. Now I just have to wait the required six confirmations uh, before I deal out my precious Harambe posters. So a little security analysis of SPV. Um, SPV nodes don't have the full transaction history, and they don't know the set of unspent transaction outputs. Uh, therefore, they don't have the same level of security as full nodes, since it can't check to see whether every transaction included in a block is actually valued. They can only verify transactions that actually affect them and must do so lazily by querying other full nodes. It makes a few key, key assumptions. Um, it assumes that the block headers that they're getting from the full nodes aren't a false blockchain. Uh, and it's, this is actually pretty fair because it's really expensive for an attacker to mine these blocks and the attacker wouldn't be able to sustain this over more than 51% of the hashing power. Um, and SPV nodes also assume that there are full nodes there that are validating all the transactions. Um, because uh, if you have miners that are creating these blocks, uh, they're also ensuring that their transactions, that the transactions that they include in their block are valid. Because if they don't, then these other full nodes on the network will see that these transactions are not valid and reject those blocks, which is a very, very expensive mistake for these miners. So that's why these are kind of a fair assumptions. Um, let me see. Yeah. Okay, so in essence, SPV nodes uh, have huge cost savings. So we talked about an 83.3 gigabyte blockchain. Now, if you only save the block headers, that reduces the size to one thousandth of its original size. So you have an 83 megabyte blockchain, megabyte blockchain, which is a lot more feasible for, you know, you can store it in your phone. Um, it's totally uh, fine for consumer use. Uh, it could be an issue for bigger merchants who need to accept a lot of incoming transactions and verify transactions quickly because in SPV you lazily verify by querying other nodes. It might just be more efficient to uh, hold a full node and the entire transaction history yourself. Um, so the conclusion is that SPV is a decent security trade-off. Now 
look at this, uh, these diagrams. These are from the original Bitcoin white paper. Just imagine that all this uh, efficiency and uh, all this like complicated crypto shit, like Satoshi came up with like in his initial white paper and design specification. Just kind of like says the 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 ridiculous amount of thinking and that uh, types of thinking that you encounter uh, when you're dealing with these kinds of distributed systems. All right, okay, so for next time, we'll be covering mining in a lot more detail. Our homework is an open book quiz on chapter one, which was our assigned reading for this week, and chapter three of the Princeton textbook. Chapter three is going to be covering a lot of the same things that I did in, this, in my part of the lecture. We'll be sending it out tom tonight or tomorrow. Um, and the readings for next time are going to be the, uh, for the slightly less technical sections of the mining chapter in the Princeton textbook. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Oh yeah, yeah. There was reading for today. What? There was reading for today. Uh, yeah. Okay, I was just checking on this site. Yeah. Is it not listed here?